Welcome to the Nightbird Radio Podcast. I'm Timothy Saylor, and I'm going to be your host this evening as we sound out the subconscious, navigate the nocturnal, and explore the farthest reaches of our experience. Coming at you from the back of an 86 Dodge Ram van on the rolling foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in the Great Forest, deep in the heart of the Kali Yuga. This is Radio for the Hauntological Turn. And welcome back, Nightbirds. It's great to have you back, and it's great to be back. I've got a fantastic episode for you this evening. It's one I've really been looking forward to, and I'm excited to share it with you. This week I had the pleasure of speaking to Jenks, author of the Thai Occult books and purveyor of amulets and other enchanted items at thetaiocult.com. He's more than that, though, and I see him as a sort of ambassador. And because of his work, many, including myself, have been able to come into an experiential awareness of an incredibly rich and ancient magical tradition that stretches back into the mists of time. We spoke of many things, including the astrological predictions for the years to come, how to make merit, and how that can help us navigate the difficult astrology ahead, seeing the magic in the present moment, amulets, ghosts, and how to get to know them better, cultivating focus to help the instincts, living your best apocalypse, and much, much more. This conversation really flew by, and I hope you enjoy listening as much as I did recording it. So, without further introduction, let's fly. Jenks, welcome to the Nightbird Radio Podcast. How are you Thank doing? You I'm very good, actually. I'm, uh, I'm just sat in, Bang- well, I'm sat in Chiang Mai, and it's, what, nine o'clock in the morning on the Saturday, and um, things are all right. Things yeah, are it looks like right. a beautiful morning out there. It's not bad because it's been raining insanely. We're getting all the rain at the moment. Oh, that's good. And uh, well, not really, because it's all going to flow to Bangkok. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bangkok, Bangkok's had it this year. But, oh, do they get a lot of flooding too? Uh, well, when it when it's heavy, you know, it's on sea level already. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And the rains have all been knocked down by the drought in China, the high pressure in China. So um, everything's going to get washed. Yeah, I, I. You know, and we're just going to jump right into it with my conspiratorial thinking, but <laughs> I think there's a lot of weather warfare going on. Um, I think it's just folks. I don't think, I don't think, well, there's, there's deliberate, deliberate stuff in trying to make it rain. Right. But uh, I don't think they're altering the weather patterns. I think they're just, everything's just reorganizing. It's following what uh, has been predicted by the models. You know, and I don't mean the ones for Gucci and people like that. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's following the predictions basically. Oh, uh, and no matter how extreme it may appear, it's going to get a lot worse. It's only just beginning. Yeah, we're just been warned. Yeah. You know, since I was a kid, we were doing World Wildlife Fund with a panda as a logo when there was a, when there was a primary school. We've been warned about it, and we did nothing. Right. Nothing. Right. So, you know, read what you sow, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the world has a way of protecting itself. Well, it's kept trying, but we keep inventing <laughs> things to um, sustain 8 billion people on the planet, which is probably 7 billion people too many, you know, to be sustainable. So, we. It, I, the change coming, we haven't predicted this with the work that we do with uh, astrologers over here. But some Western astrologers are predicting a drop in population of that magnitude. Yeah, I've seen some things. Um, yeah, also we, we can't predict that. And also, Ajahn's not willing to predict it anyway, because um, he just says it's shit. <laughs> 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 Which, you know, the first time I asked him to check out 26 to 28, he was ill for a week. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because it just gave so, him into it. So, you know, he's he just doesn't even look that deeply. He doesn't care. He's bought a sword. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's it. He's got a sword. He's, there's something in the Thai occult system called a meat more. It's like a magical knife. And you can right. make the swords as well. 
So we were having a discussion about five or six months ago about, so what are you going to do if there's civil conflict or war in this region? And he said, oh, I've got a sword. He said, it's a very romantic way to go. And um, you can chop people's heads off and use the bone. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was lovely, you know what I mean? And he said it with such glee that it really worked, you know. I can picture him saying it. That's there's great. A, there's a thing in this, you know, one reason I've decided to stay in Thailand no matter what. And part of me kind of wants it to get rough because they have a long history of war magic. And I would love to document it because they have systems where they can use their own fallen soldiers and the fallen soldiers from the other side to attack the other side as ghosts and as physical entities. So, I mean, you know, getting a chance to witness stuff like that would be quite amazing. Yeah, that's that gave me goosebumps just thinking about it. They, you know, they... There's stuff that they can pull out of the back of the cupboard. And it's documented in some of the old stories, particularly the legend of Kumpain, uh, which comes from about the 1600s originally, uh, whereby they used the ghosts of their own fallen soldiers and the soldiers on the other side to create something called a Humpayon, which is a, a spirit that can either protect or attack. And um, it seems to have been quite uh, useful in this part of the world because Thailand has never been conquered. Right. Yeah. That definitely speaks for itself. Yeah. I was just reading that part in your book. Um, I think last night, um, just a great story. The, um, it's, it's a classic and we had to kind of unearth all this when we started getting into it because the, that particular story of which is like nine or ten versions and they get softer and softer as we get to the modern day that particular story is one of the few that we've got to have an understanding of what magic they performed four or five hundred years ago and and i remember reading in the book that um that there seems to be some hints that it's not that it was actually um going back even farther than that, that that wasn't the first time that magic was used, but that it was just no, the first, that's time, the first it was, time it was written about. That's the first time it's been documented. Yeah. Right. And that was only because through a story related to the royal court, uh, some of the language used, like I was chatting with the Jan Dewey about candle magic, because in this region, the candle magic is, is the best. And I think it's probably the best in the world. And all the language within the stuff he uses is pre-Buddhist. So you, you know, Buddhism only came here like 18, 1900 years ago. So it dates from before that. Right. You know? So, I mean, beyond that, there's nothing else we can, you know, it's just before Buddhism. You know, and we can't really judge anything else because there's nothing left really of that culture otherwise. But um, it just gives an idea of the root of some of this stuff. Right. And how deep it goes. That's, and how deep it goes, yeah. And he particularly specializes in the really old stuff because it works still. And as it was designed for people, it's still relevant in this day and age as well because society and people haven't really changed. It ebbs and flows, but it's still all the same stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's this idea that we're like so technologically advanced, but that's really just a lot of... It's... Fluff. Appearance. Yeah, it's fluff, right? <laughs> it's fluff. Right. We're, We're talking same. on fluff, Tim. We're connecting <laughs> via fluff. You know? We um, really are. We are. It's it's nothing. I mean, you know, recently, up until the last five years, it's all been all the magic here has been about love magic and money and all those things that we need to be successful within society. That is now starting to change to be protection magic, invincibility magic, impenetrable skin magic. And magic to steal magic from others. We're about to do an amulet that steals other people's good fortune. It's getting, it's going to get rough. So the magic has to adapt to that roughness, you know. Right, like how you were talking about um, seeing that war magic come back. It almost, and I've often thought that 
as hardship and suffering kind of rises up in the world or in an area that mm-hmm. there's always magic and prayer and, and what have you kind of rising up to counter to meet it. it. Yeah. Right. To meet it. You know, we, it has to be that way. I mean, we're, I think we're unusual in the fact that because of the breadth of magic in, in this region, we can actually rise to meet any situation. You know, we're rising at the moment, so you've got somewhere to put your brain when when you start to go mad with the stress. And, right. And, you know, something that can protect you, something that could, you know, without, with no doubts whatsoever. Um, it's it's very interesting to watch as well, actually, because I want to see the monks doing all this because that's what will happen. The monks will start, and then you're in trouble. Right? Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't want to have to go against that. You don't want to. You know, they have a lifetime of spirituality behind them, and they are the most respected people in the country. So if they start doing rough magic, it's it's not you know, going to be good. You know it's getting there, right? Yeah, it's yeah, not so going to be great. This is kind of an interesting thing. Um, just kind of coming to my own practice, something that I see sometimes is I've lately just been getting a lot of um, a lot of communications and a lot of aid from ancestors and like, you know, like coming from way far back, like yeah. sometimes looking at me like I don't it's hard to even like to know who you are. Right. Connect. Right. Yeah. But, and, but then my first thought when this happens, cause I do a lot of, you know, ecstatic journey work and things like that. Hmm. And so it'll happen there. But my first thought after I get this is like, well, it's about, it must be about to get rough. If like these people are coming out of the word work to like, <laughs> to help me out, you know? Well, you know, we should all, so be thankful that they are in general anyway because a great a great deal of beauty comes from our, from ancestral magic you know um, and it's really one of the best forms of protection as well um very handy to use them to protect an area as well you know oh, because yes. I mean because the the land spirit houses here that everybody use really are ancestral is cultural ancestral magic. In, in many respects, you know. And if people have died on the land, it's a different type of spirit house. They use different things because then there's a direct connection to the dead from this land, you know. So, and it's the simplest way to get into magic as well. You know, we've all got photographs of our deceased ones. Make a small altar and start to praise them. You know, it can be any, you can choose any chant, any kata. You don't even need a kata as long as you make a connection mentally with these things and they will aid the life. Just make sure there's water and periodic food there and make merit. Do you understand what I mean by merit, Tim? Uh, yes, but please uh, explain for any listeners that do not. Um, it's, uh, an act, it's a good deed, basically. It's the reward for a good deed, a meritous deed. It's in English as well. Uh, in Thailand, we call it tamboon, making boon. Um, and it's a, it's like a spiritual currency in many ways. It can aid your good fortune and lift the life as well, but you can also use it to repay the help of spirits or ancestors and donate merit to them because it helps them lift in the afterworld, especially when they become angelic. You know, and most of the ancestors will be angelic by now. You know, uh, it's a beautiful currency, and we we will need merit. And we will need that kindness, particularly when things get rough. Okay. Um, so you just mentioned something that uh, I had written down in a question that I was going to get to in a little bit, but we'll just get to it now since you mentioned it. Um, okay. The idea of becoming angelic. Uh, what struck me, one of the things that really struck me in your book is um, when you talk about the city pillars. Mm-hmm. And the people that uh, gave their lives, and I think you mentioned that they become angels. Yeah. So, what in the Thai, in the Thai system or in the Thai um, lore, is an angel? Well, it's just a tip. We call it a tip, and it's just a higher being. It's not a lower being. Yeah. There's uh, fifteen levels for the angelics and sixteen levels below. Uh, for the the other beasties, yeah, uh, and they're really within the earth. They're not going down to what 
the Christians would be considered as hell in many respects. They're just a lower being. Uh, I had an interesting conversation recently with uh, Ajahn Dui again uh, about uh, usually they say that like an amulet here that uses human materials, supernatural human materials, usually they will say that the spirit will leave uh, at the point of its natural death. You know, that sell by date written on your ass when you're born. Yeah. Um, so, but they don't have to leave. They don't have to become angelic, although most of them do become angelic. And then the nature of what the amulet can do changes. And it just means that you're up instead of down, basically, or on the right. earth. Yeah, they, they, it's all, I don't really go down the uh, Western style thing of having to understand it with infinite detail. It's just got a different feeling. It's a different thing to work with. From experience, I understand what you mean. Because I there have been ancestors that came to me that were so bright that like they were the bright, like probably the brightest being that I've ever encountered. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. Well, you can keep that brightness. That brightness is sustained here through merit. So when I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of tambour and I'm making a merit as much as I can because it's part of combating the current astrology as well. Um, and when I make enough, my upstairs altar, which is to the deities, shines. Mm. Yeah, so it's like a direct relationship, a direct result of actually producing enough ben benefit for society and the spirits that influence us. I really like that as as a way of of combating the times that really resonates with me. Well, it's related to Saturn. Saturn is a pain in the ass, yeah? Uh, and he's, he causes all the stress and all the pro many of the problems uh, that's in the future, uh, especially when he teams up and has a party with Uranus and Mars and all the fiery... Uh, dramatic planets, right. you know, it's a, bit, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like a bad boy's uh, party in the hood, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, <laughs> and they're, and they're going to have a great time this next few years. Yeah, raising hell. So it's like, um, it's just combating that. But we also need to combat that ourselves. We have to make the decision to try and not be affected by it. Because, I mean, the problem with astrology and knowing these things is that people panic. Or get stressed, which is exactly what we don't want to do because right. <laughs> that will make it worse anyway. Yeah. So it's all things like, you know, you've got to keep fit at this time. We've got to practice having focus and not being distracted. And basically try and just carve out a place for ourselves where we can be safe. And merit helps with that at the same time. So yeah. Um I actually, this is why I bought this van. <laughs> That's You're in I, the van? I yeah, thought, uh, yeah. I thought it was something like uh, Ant-Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a, it's a surfer van. It's an 86. It's the same year as me. Fantastic. I love yeah. That. And there's no computer in it. You know, it's wow. old school. Okay. Wow. So, you know, they can't just like shut it off remotely. <laughs> So, so yeah. you've actually got that for doing the podcast and for escape and going. Yeah, into right. So I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to get it to the point where I can just bug off uh, at any hmm. moment. You know what I mean? And do the podcast. Yeah. yeah. So I'm in the process of doing that. I'm doing some work on the engine. Um, and I really don't know anything about that, but it's, <laughs> it's been great learning. And, you know, they used to make cars so that you could work on them. Yeah, this is another interesting thing that you mentioned about the past five years is that something that I've learned is that modern cars are almost you need like a doctorate to even figure out what the hell's going on in it. Yeah, but and this, the computer and everything else, yeah, all that. This, I can, I mean, while it's running, I can put my hand in it and just kind of like, I mean, I not that you necessarily want like it. It's not a good idea, but <laughs> it can be done. But it's, and I understand what you mean. It's, right. uh, I don't, I don't get it. I have other people to do the car, but also we're just waiting to go electric at some point, whenever it's good enough 
and there's right. stuff here that we can afford. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, it's all too slow anyway. It's it's not going to make that much difference, to be frank with you. It's too slow. We should have been doing this 30 years ago. And, you know, I think that part of that is um, obviously just greed. You know, you always hear about those people that came up with an engine that can run on water and then they well, mysteriously die. They're trying to revamp the hydrogen system and get it going again. But there's, you know, it's just vested interest. But, I mean, I asked uh, a couple of astrologers, where are we in 2030? Yeah. And to which they responded, well, if you live, um, it's the end of authoritarianism, which I thought was a very interesting answer, actually. It's also the end. There was one bit where we were chatting with Ajahn Apichai, and he's just kind of, Shift going through his charts for about four or five years hence in the, in this area because he, he'd done a chart for Thailand and he's done a chart recently for China so you can do you can read a country's astrology as well um, and he said oh wow there's no money there <laughs> what the fuck do you mean there's no money <laughs> he said no we're not using money in that few months there. It's like, oh, for God's sake, how am I going to sell anything? <laughs> wow. I Yeah, that really is interesting. It's, it's, this is what we just can't handle. And it's sometimes best. I don't talk about it to that many people either, you know, but, um, because we just can't handle it. And you just sound like a nutter, you know. Yeah, oh, that's, I mean, my, my family doesn't listen to me about any of that stuff. And it's I've probably yeah. a good idea <laughs> <laughs> because really, you know, there's two branches of people here. There's the ones that want to know, and it's not going to kill them with stress, and they actually want to consider their options. Yeah, right. and the ones who really don't want to know. Yeah, and, and there's a lot more of the don't want to know than there are the do want to know. I find that to be the case here as well. Um, yeah. And that's okay. I mean, you know, they, I mean, they can all go and die and we might survive. But um, right. it's not a matter of building bunkers. It's not a matter of anything else. We just, all people need is a food supply and some water. The way I'm trying to face it is with adaptability. If I yeah. can, if I can pivot and I can change, you know, because that's just kind of been a natural thing that's been ingrained of me from the way my life has gone. And now it's like, Oh shit. Now that's a superpower. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's also about really um, about society and community. Right. Because all the transporting stuff between countries has got to stop instantly. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the, the wars that are going to break out in the, in the various regions will do a very good job of stopping that. Um, but it's, <clears throat> you know, it's just going to get local. It's going to go back to what it was like when I was a kid, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, that sounds great to me. I don't know. Um, but without, but with a lot less stuff, a lot less. And that's all right. You know? Yeah. Totally. You, fine with that. you can eat and you've got a cat and, or a dog, whichever you like. And, right. you know, <laughs> It's, you know, it's going to go back to the simplicity of life. And that's not a bad thing. And the whole system will change. Everything will change. Yeah, because I, I mean, I've listened to a lot of people that know far more of what they're talking about than I do. And most of them seem to say that we just we're not living right. You know, no, we're not, and, and that's been the case for a long time. Right. And that's why COVID came, no matter what the conspiracy theories are. Nature's been trying to get rid of us for a long time, and we keep finding ways out of it. And that's been the case throughout geological history. I studied geology at university, you know. And, you know, you can, like, the ammonite, the curly shell that most people will know of, you know, that was around for a long time. And, but at the end of its existence, the it was... Um, evolving so quickly it actually becomes a very useful tour tool for dating rocks you know and then you know it said some parts of the world that the shell started to unravel and all the sections between 
that as part of its growth all change shape. And so you can sometimes date things to like one or two or five million years, which is nothing in the geological history. Right. Look how much we've changed in the last 200. You're sat in a van and I'm in Chiang Mai, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talking over ra- radio waves. Well, so we're, you know, we're looking at changes in decades, physical changes as well, not millions of years. And that's the pressure of uh, evolution when existence becomes challenged. Yeah, that's uh, going back to the cell phone thing and the Internet. It's, you know, these are great tools. It's allowing us to have this conversation right now. But and I they do will probably wonder... Stay. They sure, don't need yeah. to go in you some know, they form, don't need right? To go anywhere, yeah, man, yeah. No, and 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 that's a good point too. Um, what can we take through the eye of the needle that is useful, and what must we leave behind? Waste. That's it. Right. Waste and shit we don't need. Yeah, you know, like this computer I'm on at the moment might have to last me thirty years. Right. Right. If we're lucky. Yeah, it's going to get tough to get uh, microchips. It, I mean, it already is in some places. Yeah, but I mean, you know, but again, you know, everybody's now repatriating stuff and everything else. I mean, that will probably continue. It just means right. that most pe- people will have no access to them whatsoever. You know, there might be no demand for them whatsoever or a tiny demand. You know, it's just going to... Because, I mean, even in this conversation, you can see how we're trying to hang on to stuff instead of letting it go. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing to watch amongst all these things. Um, uh, and we don't know yet what we're going to have to let go of. But one of the things we can't let go of is belief in society and other people and um, praising what everything you want to praise and the spirituality and nature, they're, they're the things that we cannot lose. Because if we lose those, we're finished as a species. Right. That's you what know? makes I mean, us I mean, human, I think. You know? Yeah, I think it helps. I mean, luckily, I've chosen here instead of the UK where I come from because of the strength of society here. And it's Buddhist. You know, I mean, if the shit hits the fan, the first thing I'll do is go to the what? the temple and say, how can I help? You know, yeah, that is. I might end up cooking food for everybody or just doing stuff or, you know, I mean, last time I walked into the temple around the corner, the workers building a new building were trying to get me involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> As a joke, so, but only right. half a joke. <laughs> yeah, unless you say yes, then it's not a joke. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, it's... that that really struck me um because how can I help is really one of the things that has kind of kept me sane as well. How can I be helpful? How can I be useful? How can how we can be I... of service? Right. Um that it, when I am at my worst if I'm at my most demoralized, mm-hmm. if I turn and ask, how can I help? I'm not thinking, I'm not here anymore. I'm not thinking about me. I'm not this thinking is... about ego. I am in the world. Yeah. And you're, um, we're back to merit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's the benefit of it. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're. That's what is essential, really, over this uh, coming period. Um, November looks really fucking dodgy, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, November. Yeah. It's. <laughs> I, I John just goes. I don't want to talk about it. It's shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's got. Um, he thinks it's going to really hit the fan in November. And uh, probably the uh, economy is going to really drop a bit further. It's been going down in steps for ages. Right. But it's going to drop substantially in November. Uh, and he's got uh, early next year for war in Asia. Oh, in Asia. Okay. Yeah, because I see the... Right. I see the war... The in war. Europe, it's getting worse. That's November as well. 
Yeah, at least it'd be easy to collect the body parts for ambulance if the ground's frozen because they can't bury anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't yeah. happen here, man. You know, it's too easy to stick them in the ground. No, know? I I love that about from what I've gleaned of Thai culture from reading your book and from listening to you, just a really healthy relationship with death because I think that that's one of the ways that we're really out of balance here in the West is that we are totally afraid of it to the point where we ignore it. And that's mm-hmm. just not any way to deal with like the most important, one of the most important things I came here to do. Right. I'm here yeah. to die. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, what can we do to help before that? You know, right. it, it kind of adds the urgency to life as well, which we all need. Right. It's uh, and some you know it's it's difficult is that because some people live too long and some people don't live long enough. Very few die at the right time, or what they consider to be the right time. You know what I mean? I'm just hoping to get through this podcast. To be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll try but to get you through uh, it. <laughs> exactly. I've got I've got medical staff in the other room. <laughs> yeah, they might have to give you a shot of B vitamins or something. Oh, it won't be V vitamins. <laughs> but, um, or it'll be that good yeah. stuff, huh? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I was chatting with one of my favorite Jans, a Jan Pern Rung last week, and he said, when are you ever going to retire? I said, well, what the hell would I do if I retired? I'd be a pain in the ass. But I have decided to take, once I get everything done, and it should be by December, I'm going to take December off and just make some dope cookies, buy some very fine Armagnac that's in our local nice supermarket at the moment and um, reconnect with all my friends because we need to at this time. You know, it's been, especially the last few months have been such kind of madness and turmoil that we really need to recreate our own family again and, you know, firm those bonds and, because also we don't know who we're going to lose. And yeah. people come and go as ghosts. You know, it's, it's right. nice to have them around, but it's much nicer to have around a living being. Yeah, to experience that joy in the now, I think, is, has been, it's has been really good for me. Yeah. Yeah, to stay to life without it, we'd all be dead. You know? to, hold that, to hold that in the heart space. Yeah, man, it's it's what carries us through. You know, every particularly every man will go through difficult periods of understanding their position in life and all the rest of it. And it's it's the living that can help us with that. The death the, for me, the dead help help me with um, the quality of life. Like you know, all those nice things that we need, like an income and good fortune and. Being have being surrounded by good friends because they help with that as well, and you know, it's uh, it's interesting in that respect, and it's good to have that dichotomy of belief as well. So we deal with it in two separate fields without becoming too much one way or too much the other. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to go back to amulets a little bit, and that's a good segue. Um, talking about that passage from uh, Kun Pain. Uh, from mm-hmm. your book about Kun Pan, about um, how the amulets call us to grow into the advantage that they offer. I think it's on yeah. page 334 of your book. Um, I don't remember, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, yeah I, get I, was, saying, I get people saying, you wrote this, you know, did I? <laughs> well, I was, I thought about reading it, but I didn't know how you felt about someone reading you your book. So I wasn't going to do that. No, no, I love it. Gonna... <laughs> I, if, if, because they can, they can make a difference to people's lives. Okay. They so can just. I'll read the passage it, really quick then. Go on then. Because I wanted you to talk about it a little bit. Um, okay. And this is according to a Jarn Apichai. There is a significant perception problem with this ability in that people think it will give them power and an excuse for inappropriate behavior, talking about mm-hmm. um, attraction. A Jarn asks, why would you want a slave rather than a willing participant? And why would someone want to be with you if you behave in this manner? Yeah. What the attributes of the Kun Pan talisman do is give an advantage that you can then grow into and develop within the confines of the magic available. That was really interesting to me because I, that's been my experience with these amulets. Yeah. And I'm, it's, 
Go ahead. We, we are offered things throughout life, and it's not just from um, talismans that have ghosts in them. It's from everything. It's from teachers. It's from friends and everything else. Yeah. But we often don't live within the moment of them being offered because we're too busy or the mind's not still enough to be able to understand the true nature of what the life that these things can bring. Yeah. The Thais believe that every meeting is important because you never know what's going to happen with the person you meet. Yeah, you might have just met your lover for the rest of your life. And so they look for magic for the moment that they can live within. But separate from that, we have to grow as people. So we're not going to push it, push the magic to a point where it rebels against us or we just look like awful individuals. Magic doesn't work for awful people. In the end, they're caught out, in my opinion. Um, it's you know, we have to use it in in as good a way as possible so that we don't necessarily hurt people, yeah? And I like the relationship to the ghost with these things as well because some people can feel ghosts and some people can't. It's, it's based on the birth astrology. You can tell, the ties can tell by looking at your birth astrology whether you can work with ghosts or whether you can have uh, pry, which is human materials from supernatural sources, from bodies that have died way before their time, often violently, suicide, etc. Um, but that takes a certain constitution of the body that comes through the astrology to be able to handle them and work with them in a beneficial manner. Yeah. And in many ways, so where John Apichai is saying that, where there was another great comment recently in the, the last book that we're going to do um, about regional magic, and Ajahn Samat was explaining how to have a relationship with a ghost from these amulets, which is really beautifully done. It was one of those rare interviews where every single thing he said was worth was worthy of being passed on to others. And he said, well, it's like getting to know a cat. Yeah, you have to um, treat it well. You have to be kind to it. You have to get used to it being there. And eventually it's there all the time for you. Right. Thought, you definitely can't force it. <laughs> you can't force a cat. No, you can't. You can't force a ghost. Yeah, it's got, it takes time. Uh, and there's one or two things I've got here that I've had for quite a while and always kept, and I've only just started working with them in the correct way, um, which surprises me when I realise things like that. And it's, it's just basically down to being ready to do it and having patience with yourself and being ready to, um, to have that particular spirit in your life. I'll give you an example. Please. I know this is not going out as a film, but that, which I'm holding up, is a carved, there you go. Oh, you yeah. That's and beautiful. on the back, it's got a hand-drawn skeleton, and it's a carved um, third-eye skull piece from a nun that died in an accident. And my favourite magician, a monk called Lauren Poppy, I used her whole body in amulets, um, flesh the lot, because she had a supernatural body in that her remains smelled sweet instead of smelling like death. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So this is an incredibly rare, rare thing. This, yeah, that's really miraculous stuff. It's um, it's really rather beautiful, and you know it comes from that region there. The forehead, the forehead, including the third eye. That's and a, Pen a Penang, correct? A Pe Penang, yeah. Penang. I'm, Penang. I was, I, was Penang. Gonna, I, I meant to preface this by saying I'm going to mispronounce a lot That's of. That's pretty good words. though. You were, you were good with you were good with Kung Pen. It's difficult. Oh. To pronounce Kung Pen. <laughs> um, and you know, in the end, from being initially kind of wary of this because it's such a strong thing, in the end, um, she's just gorgeous. But it's taken me a year 
to get to that point, you know, and a year of talking to various people to understand how to praise it, an amulet such as this, because they're all kind of unique when they get to this level. Right. Like people are unique, you know. So now she gets a sweet perfume every morning and she enjoys flowers being put next to her, et cetera. But I never, I've still yet to ask her to do anything for me. Mm. There's no need. She will decide that. If I right. need to ask her, it feels like she would be very good at persuading people to uh, either leave me alone or uh, to pay money back, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. And if that fails, I'll just send, I'll just ask her to go and eat in their house it, from their food. <laughs> And then, then they'll leave me alone. And yeah. then you don't have to do anything, you see? You know? Yeah, I don't think there'd be a problem for you anymore after that. Yeah, it's well, you know, a peaceful life is a wonderful life. Oh, yeah. And um, we're going to need the ability to keep it peaceful as well. Right. It's coming. Yeah. Do you see ghosts, Tim? Um, I don't see them, but I have experienced them in other ways. I've heard them. Mm-hmm. Um, okay the audience yeah yeah and i can feel them yeah um tingles and seeing like that. them is quite rare to be honest only a few right. people see them i tend to catch them out of the corner of my eyes uh, but not the ghosts that i work with they tend to be interlopers Right. Sometimes I have to clear the house a bit, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, and I have blessings from monks every week and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's it's odd in that respect, but you can – I find it interesting, the voices you can get in your head from the ghosts as well, because it's definitely one of the uh, origins of thought. Yeah. And, and those are uh, spirits, right? Well, in time, you – one thing I think we need to do in life is learn about how we, a thought is created and how thought influences us and try and work out the difference between it being from you or being from an outside spiritual influence or being from the astrology because they're the three things that can influence our thinking processes. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, that's something that I've been trying to work with a lot lately is uh, working with the intuition. And sometimes um, I'll see it clearly in my mind's eye, too. I'll get that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you said seeing them out of the corners of your eye. That'll happen to me. And then also, and <laughs> this is kind of, interesting like this has started happening since i've gotten these amulets um from your site uh and working with them sometimes when i close my eyes i can see things moving in the darkness behind my eyelids i think these things affect everybody in different ways yeah yeah? and there is no one correct way but what we're, but the thing I think is important with this is to greet it all with equanimity. Right. And it's not unpleasant. Yeah, it's just it's not unpleasant, but it's also but what can happen is that um it ends up being wow, I see ghosts and oh, you yeah, know, right. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, I that, think I've I've been like that in the past. I, <laughs> well, I think that's the first stage, to be honest. That's what I'm getting at. That's yeah. the first thing that people kind of uh, get into and that can be very addictive for a long time right and it's what kind of i tend to kind of avoid or i haven't got the time and i don't think it helps with anything really except to um lead ourselves astray yeah it's right. you know i've talked to a dancer about this and he's a very very clairvoyant man and um, as, you know, we were talking, discussing ghosts, and he said, "I said, do you see the ghosts in the graveyard when you're working with them?" He said, "Oh, there's two that are always trying to scare me, but I just ignore them. They're not very nice. I just work with two or three other really nice people who have just had a, died in a terrible way, 
and want to earn the merit to be able to pass on to the next existence as soon as they can or to rise up, you know. So um, I kind of like his description of these things in the fact that we're just looking for things that are not scary, things that are a benefit or pleasant, things that influence us in a very pleasant way. Just as you would with people. I mean, like I would have... It's exactly the same. It just happens that they're dead. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Right on. It's it's odd, you know, to talk like this because I don't normally do it. Well, I I appreciate you talking with me like this. Because I, I, I don't, um, I just, I think people should know uh, that there is a better way of doing it because we can't be wowed every time. At some point, we've got to become responsible for the abilities that you have or responsible right. for the things that are coming forward and to learn how to listen and to also learn when it's, um, when it's fake. Right. Or somebody, something being duplicitous, you know, or something that we're investing too much into, which means we can be producing it ourselves. There's lots of self-fooling and manipulation going on. And if we can just keep our centre, these things become very apparent and can then really help the life, you know. Yeah, that's why I think um, the most useful practice that's, and my whole time of of exploring this stuff is just your just good old mindfulness meditation. Yeah, that's why they do it. That's why it's important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's if you can focus and internalize that everything else bounces off. Yeah, if um, what we last year we offered a ritual um, for refuge with the Buddha, and it basically involved putting an astrological to crook of the person who um, basically bought into the ritual um, into a Buddha, quite a nice large one that's been, that was placed into one of the, um, well, perhaps the oldest what in the Chiang Mai area, because um, it was there before Chiang Mai itself. And it holds Buddhist relics in a stupa, as well. It's an incredible place. And the head monk allowed us to do it, and we made part of the fee was a donation. And it just gives me and anybody else who's in it the ability to place themselves in the confines of the what. So you can journey temple. to you can journey to the temple. You can put yourself directly in that, like that, with a little bit of practice, and immediately the mind settles. You have the feeling of being in the what. Yeah, so it's incredibly useful. We're doing another one, and we're just waiting to get to 100 people, 100 to cut, so we can give a nice donation to the temple, you know, 50,000, 80,000 baht, something like that, and um, which then benefits everybody as well because it's based on merit. And um, it gives... The tiniest practice people get, but the difficulty is that when we are stressed, being separate enough from it, which comes with samadhi and meditation, to be able to realize, okay, I'm going to go and sit in Wat Doi Kham for a while. And I can, I've got it down to seconds to stop difficult thought patterns, which is pretty quick. You know? Yeah, that's great. It's, it's, it works. So, I mean, there's, there's, even if they're not practicing as much samadhi or meditation, say, the same thing can come through yoga, breathe, any breathing practice, right, right. martial arts, anything like that, you will still build enough samadhi to be able to do it. We don't have to follow the traditional way. Uh, other religions, same. If you, you know, if you practice any other form of religion to a good degree, you will have samadhi. It's not only confined to the Thai practices. And right, in that yeah. way, if we had it, we can improve our life. It seems to be a baseline for all spiritual practice, in my opinion. I mean, for what is. I've seen, baseline for all spiritual practice, yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's in the Islamic faith, in Christianity, yeah. the lot. It's in all of them. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. Because, yeah. So I I did not grow up Catholic at all. I grew up Protestant in the mm-hmm. s- Southern United States. So that's just kind of a different experience. But through my um, the, my magical practice and you know working with different saints, I started saying the Rosary. Uh-huh. Well, now working with these amulets, you know, I bought some beads from your site. And I'm now saying uh, Namatasa. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the same. 108 times. Yes. And it is, it really. The same. Yeah. But it's, I like the flavor, you know, like I, I like getting that. Um, I think there's an advantage to it not being part of our culture. Right. Yeah? Because I, I wasn't brought up anything. My, my father hated religion. Um, he just didn't really appreciate it at all. Um, so, but being from the UK, I grew up as a Christian, in a Christian country. Right. So yeah. you had that it's framework. Kind of, yeah. You know, and you, you, there's all the mentalities that are, um, associated with that particular religion and all that sort of stuff. So it's still a flavor outside of what I know. And I took to it like a duck to water. And in the same way, I like the foreignness of it, the freshness of it. It's an escape. Yeah, and I, I, the kata, it's something else, because <laughs> it's and it's hard. Like, <laughs> obviously, it's hard for me to describe because I'm not doing a very good job of it. But <laughs> <laughs> well, these are very like, complicated issues, man. They're and you know, complicated. but like the act of learning it while connecting with the amulet, and then like sometimes you know it'll get stuck in your head like a song. And I just treat yeah. that as the connection growing. It's like, you know, yeah. like when you think of someone, a friend or something. Like People just think of it as only saying namo tasa. Yeah, but you're moving your thumb. You have to learn how to breathe. You have to learn how to keep the mind still. And the next layer of that, what you're doing, by the way, when you get really good at it, <clears throat> the next layer is whereby if you see a thought come in your mind while saying the 108 start again oh yeah that's good <laughs> that that's can really take good. a little bit of time <laughs> but it, it can be it kind of distances you from yourself and just trying to race through it and things starting to interfere with stuff from the right. outside world yeah sure um it works it works and it's a very good training method yeah, I'll have to try it because it has a nice little as- aspect of punishment too. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we like that. I mean, yeah, uh, right. we from, you know what I mean? Near culpa and all that lot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the wrong religion, but you know. What I mean? <laughs> oh, <I'm laughs> Who so- cares as long as a bit of self annihilation <laughs> is involved? It's mm-hmm. really interesting, though. Like, I, I haven't, um, I haven't encountered a lot of objects of this level of power um and i have a buddy that i i went to visit him this past weekend an old friend of mine and um he's the one that got me into got me into everything i'm into you know like uh, he just he introduced i actually found you through gordon white's rune soup site yeah uh his podcast and so this is the friend that introduced me to him and gordon's a remarkable fellow he really is. He's. I, he's I'm lucky guy. to have had him in my life. Um, yeah, because yeah, he's on to the same kind of models that you know are helping me kind of navigate this time. Yeah. Um. And so this, I, I have the um, this Rahu, the co- one-eyed coconut Rahu amulet. Oh yeah. And I was like, hey man, you just gotta feel this. You just gotta just like take this here, and he like couldn't even like stop staring at it. He couldn't put it down, and he said that it was like tingles went up and down his body. Yeah, which is exactly the feeling of it. Like it's objective, you feel it, and that's yeah. amazing to me. And as something of such astonishing simplicity, but that does not say anything about the level of power that it carries. Right, yeah. like it's well, it's natural for a start off. Right, yeah, it comes from a natural source, but it comes from a supernatural source as well. 
in the fact that it's a one-eyed coconut. There's only a few every 10,000 found. Coconuts normally have three eyes at top, three dents, yeah? Right, right. These have two. So one is the eye and one is the mouth, which eats good fortune and stores it for the person when you're uh, using the whole coconut. But that's unusual, that particular Rahu you've got, because it's by an old monk called uh, Luang Po Ki. And on the back of it, there is a very small piece of cloth. And that is a piece of his robe, because everything that touches his body becomes magic, basically. So it's like a cross between... um, And they only generally use one-eyed coconuts for Rahu. It's associated with Rahu magic. Uh, but that's also been crossed with the fact that it's associated now with monk magic because that's very right. small piece of knocks away malicious forces. Rahu has an element of that as well, but he's primarily for a refreshing of the lines of fate and a rising of the destiny. Yeah. And the interesting thing, the, the bit that I love with this is the fact that it really upsets the Indians. <laughs> they're terrified of Rahu right and yeah the guys are like oh come along and praise Rahu he's okay <laughs> See, to just me, give that, him black foods you yeah know? that just seems like good remediation I love giving him black foods it's been a cool um a full moon ritual put him in the, the moonlight yeah oh and, yeah on the full know, moon I haven't done that yet okay I will do it yeah okay. white cloth is the best just place white it cloth. in the moonlight it's like having a, a Rahu disco going on. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. It's Excellent. wonderful. Yeah, Particularly the good. rising moon. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I'm in a Rahu ruled time in Vedic astrology. I don't know too much about it, but it's interesting the way that this one came to me because it was actually gifted to me. I didn't purchase it off the site. It was mm-hmm. gifted to me by someone else who a just conversation came up and I was talking about uh, wanting to work with Rahu a little bit. And yeah, so it's just, it's funny how these things happen, right? Like, well, I remember this me. discussion this morning. I keep laughing with a friend of mine, Eric, who reminded me of a story I've got to tell you, actually, since this is actually meant to be about ghosts and we're going all over the place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like it, don't worry. Um, and, you know, we often joke about how these things just improve coincidence. Yeah. Like, uh, he wants to come and visit in November, but, you know, he keeps buying uh, astonishing amulets and they're not cheap, the, the right. top one. And so he keeps spending all his holiday money. I'm going, stop fucking buying amulets, man. That'd be nice to see you, you know? And um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, strangely, this morning he said, oh, I might have $8,500 coming because the landlords have been very naughty and, affected my quality of living so I'm, I'm going to put a claim against them with the strict rules in support of people who rent property in san francisco i'm going what a lovely coincidence that is isn't it you know, we, keep, we keep saying this well, what a nice coincidence that is isn't that yeah. funny yeah it's uh and that's the way it works it just kind of all just shifts things onto a nice path yeah. i um that's really funny that you mentioned that too, because I actually had to be reminded of it. I um, have the computer that I was using to record this podcast mm. die on me. And it was right after I got this amulet, this Rahu. Yeah. And I was like, shit. And so like in the same day, I was like, how am I going to make the podcast? You know? Well, in the same day, I came into a laptop that's like, way better than my computer was just given to me. Yeah. And I had to actually be reminded like, oh yeah, you think that's probably like connected somehow? It's, co- it's just a very nice coincidence. <laughs> it's a nice coincidence, right? Yeah. See, but I have to right remember is- that stuff because I have to um, thank, give thanks, right? Well, just make merit. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, whenever beneficial stuff happens, I'm actually... Uh, I make merit every week at Wat Doi Kam because that's where we have the Buddha, yeah? And another one's going in soon, much to the kindness of the head monk there. Um, but at this time, I'm trying, I was going, trying to find to 
make merit at the local temple as well. But they're always out doing stuff. It's very difficult. I went three times and still couldn't manage it. So instead, I'm going to start assaulting the monks on the street in the morning and just giving you, you know, five or ten dollars to every single one I see in the morning, just to make merit, because then we may get more coincidences. Nightbirds, I hope you've been enjoying the conversation so far, and there's more to come. But first, I have to ask that you support the show. As I'm sure you've noticed, there are no commercials on this show. There are no paywalls. You get everything up front. For there to be free dialogue here, I think it must remain uncaged by the interests of advertisers. But Nightbird Radio does cost time and money to make, and your support means I can spend less time delivering pizza and more time doing this. That's a win-win. So that's why Nightbird Radio is a value-for-value value podcast. I hope you've found value in this show, but I can't and won't dictate just how much. Only you can decide that. But what I can do is invite you to take that value, turn it into a number, and head to www.nightbirdpodcast.com and hit the donate button located on the front page to offer your support. We're also listed on podcastindex.org, which means you are able to send Bitcoin via the Lightning Network using your favorite podcasting 2.0 apps, which can be found at newpodcastapps.com. And finally, I also accept dry goods. Email me at tim at nightbirdpodcast.com for more information. Sponsors will get a special mention on the show. Thank you for your generous support. Now let's get back to the conversation. And I do find that it's interesting, too, because it really does give this feeling of something. It's able to move through you, right? Like, yeah. it's coming to me, and now I get to pass it on. But if I try to sit on it and hoard it, all of a sudden, I'm not having so many nice coincidences. You're not being open-hearted enough. Right. Yeah? So, I mean, you've also got to consider that, you know, even though – I'm the type of person who's had three or four periods in life that have been incredibly beneficial. And I recognize them because I'm, I'm open to these things. And in between these periods, I do jobs that I enjoy, like working in the bar, or I used to do loads of security and all that sort of stuff, yeah. you know, the fun stuff. Um, and it came to me, while well, when I first started getting into this about eight years ago, um, I just started having all the ideas that I get when I'm in, about to enter a new, very interesting phase. And it, part of it, I just thought, ah, now, is that my instinct? Yeah, Is that the instincts that are being raised by praising these things? Or is it these things directly talking through my body? Because instincts are physical, in my opinion. You're right. being told something by your body. Because in English, we say, what does your stomach tell you? Sure. Yeah, so it's the same sort of thing, and I think they also do improve the instincts. And there's actually certain amulets that help you um, hone your foresight and instinctive nature, uh, because it can save your life, your instincts. Right, and I, 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 when you say those three things, I mean, I feel if they can all be in alignment, that's the sweet spot, right? When they're in alignment, you and you are not necessarily forcing anything or thinking, life is guided in its natural manner. And depending right. on your birth astrology, that can be incredibly beneficial. And we, cool. there's one quote in my new book, it says, the only thing that gets in the way of a life of magic is you. <laughs> yeah. You know, we yeah. get in the way of it, wanting to happen. Right. Yeah. I um, think that often I've put negative spells on myself. It, everybody does. Right. That's that's, that's where the, that's where I put the quote in for. You know, because it's it just gets in we get in the way of a good life often. Yeah, I, if when I'm out of my own way then I, other beneficial forces are able to move through me. It's just like what we were talking about with make, the making uh, merit same yeah. idea, right? And it's I, yeah. just losing the onion skins, the layers of emotion that we acquire 
or we're given at birth or something that we have to work through ourselves or whatever else. Right, um, something karmic or... There's lots of, I think it's, I think it's a lot of stuff to be, a lot of different directions to be on. Right. And, uh, you know, we have to start that process as soon as we can. So we have enough time. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't, I didn't come here to, you know, the way I see it with intentionality, I didn't come here to ignore that stuff. I've spent a good deal of time trying to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the same now, thing. Now it's time it's to uh, to face it, right? Yeah. And this is why also this stuff is rising at this time. You know, there's there's no coincidence here. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> or it's a coincidence that it's rising at this time. Right. Well, the, you know, well, you know uh, the funny thing about coincidence is, is that they they are incidents that happen at the same time. And I think to, to brush that off is silly. <laughs> well, it's, like, things that happen at you, the same time to me are connected because. Well, then no, that takes, that takes an awareness to see it. Sometimes people just think that was lucky and then they go out and drink a bottle of whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> or go, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, right. it's just being aware enough to understand that it is a beneficial coincidence. That's interesting. I was just talking um, to my last guest about um, we were talking about communication with angels hmm. and how often what they say is just right now is where the power is. It's right here and right now in this moment, because this moment is where the choice is able to be made. It's not anywhere else. It's all. And that's kind of like the same thing, right? It's, it's it's all there. It's it's the same statement. You know, I've never. It's the only. It's the first quote I've ever put in from myself in a book because nobody else has ever said it. <laughs> right, right, right. No, it's good stuff. I really enjoy you it. Yeah, it's just. But it all comes from a, a lifetime of trying and, to get around these things. You know. Right. Which. Uh, I did want to ask. Okay, since we were talking about amulets, and um, I wanted to ask you. If you're willing to answer, what um, what is the the amulet or any kind of enchanted object that hits you the hardest? Well, it will be. It's not the same for everybody, right? Yeah, right. Um, and I think it develops as we develop. So. You know, the first amulet to hit me the hardest was the first amulet. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah you only time, get one first, right? At that time. And that actually, that amulet changed my life. It was a humpayon made out of sticks to look like a, a Thai boxer using the thread from a funeral to make the headband. And he had little gloves on as well from the funeral. And uh, that was from Luang Po and that about eight years ago, nine years ago. And it just, I think it had things latching on and it just knocked them off. And it was just like setting off in a Lamborghini. You know, it was just phenomenal, the difference it made. I suppose after that would be, then they start investigating other types of spirits and everything else. But really, and some of them are strong, the next thing that wowed me was a Luke Grok's arm from the same maker. Now, a Luke Grok is a fetus that's been robbed of life. Yeah. And this was a very young one. The arm was no more than about a centimeter. So this had come from an abortion clinic. Right. And it was in oil and it was just nuclear. It was like a nuclear reactor. It was so strong. Yeah. And um, that had a great effect. I didn't buy it. It was a fortune. I didn't really want to have a fetus, his arm around my neck at that time. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, you're going to start running out of them in America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you're good. But, um, yeah. <laughs> we don't hold back the, here. Uh, after, the, after that really was when I discovered my... Uh, spiritual influence, really. The, 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 the maker that I adore the most, and it's Long Poppy now, because one of the first Ajans I 
went to see Ajahn Chalun, he basically sold off the temple's collection, his old temple's collection, when Ajahn Samat, who was the boss then, died. This is about seven years ago, uh, at time which Luang Po had been dead about 13 years. And, you know, they were just trays of stuff, all made out of meat, bone products, you know, just the maddest, maddest shit going in there. And beautiful stuff as well. All the layers of what he did as well, because he used to make stuff specifically for rich people that were encrusted with gems. And, you know, I mean, he made a, he made a lot of money because he lived in a very poor area of the country, Saratbury, and it's still shit poor. And he supported his community as a good monk. That was a big turning point in my life, to the point where I still go to the temple. Ajahn Chalev is now the monk at that temple, looking after it. He's overseeing its rebuilding and the correct, what he perceives as being the correct position of Long Paul in Pina, in the history of magic in Thailand. Um, and I just got, I've just thought it's, it's not here. Ah, these are, one minute. Yeah. And while I was there, a while back, he gave me the flesh, a small ball of Luang Paul's flesh, because they kept his body for using in amulets with his permission. This guy was no hypocrite. Yeah. And um, while I was there this time, there we are. We got some old amulets that are made of silver and platinum. It's oh, wow. called the Dao. And his long pause bone is in the top of those. Yeah, so the connection I have with uh, this monk is really quite profound. And that's kind of where I still am. And sometimes I will not go or not go to the temple for a while, but I'm always dragged back there at some point because um, it's just now a major part of the journey. So, okay, you mentioned that um, that everything that touched that monk was considered, became holy when you were talking about this amulet. Um, and the, the with reference wrote. to the, 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 the Rahu, yes. Right. So but Now we're talking a, about physical body. Actual body. pieces. Yeah. So that's, that's wow. Um, yeah. And, and, and so that gives you a connection. To, why they're coming to me. <laughs> well, I would imagine because Long Porpina is coming to you. Like, is, that's literally what's happening, right? Yeah, basically. <laughs> Well, I, I know in the Supernatural Thailand book, I wrote the story of Long Popina, and, um, you know, I've photographed most of that place as well, including the building that you shouldn't really go in because it's so badly built. He used to, I think he survived on cigarettes and Red Bull. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, he was, I mean, he, need, he needed spiritual energy, man. Yeah. Um, and the building, which I love, is is falling down because basically the floors is a very thin layer of concrete and then standing bottles of Red Bull, thousands of them, and then another thin layer of concrete on top of that. Yeah, and um, it just amuses me that nothing was ever wasted. You know what I mean? It yeah, must that's have great. Thousands of them, and. Um, Every time I go, I discover new stuff. Like that building is actually a supernatural building because that in the centre of that building is the crematorium. Oh, yeah. So he built the building around the crematorium. So anybody that's been cremated there that's died a supernatural death, road accidents and all that sort of stuff, suicides, that building is now actually a supernatural building. You know, And it's just, he's, he's mind-boggling. So it's, a, it's like a pry building. Yeah, basically. And I've yet to walk up the hill behind the temple because there is still there. He was famous for what were called lightning bolts because lightning is one of the ultimate sources of natural power. 
And he had a, a metal spike sticking out of the top of the hill behind the temple, and he'd surround them with small balls of metal that were from melted old, um, uh, like you know, statues, metal statues, Buddhist statues, all things that been used for spiritual nature. And when the lightning struck there, all those pieces of metal would be charged, and then they'd go in his ambulance. You know, the, the whole what was just full of magical plants. Whoa. So it was just, it was a constant job. But this is a man who walked to India in the late 50s and early 60s on a spiritual quest. So he walked through the jungles of Burma and India to get to the place where, try to get to where Buddha was born. But it was so difficult because nobody knew that they had to feed him, that he nearly died. And he came back after doing like a few thousand miles. You know? Wow. And, he, and this, my favourite photograph of him is when he got back, he's holding a three-pronged short stick, you know, like the Shiva held, and his eyes are just like Austin Osmond's bear or yeah. like Crowley, you know, they're just wild-eyed. Right, just on fire. Yeah, man. Yeah. And he was he was just a very special man, you know. Um and it's it's kind of wonderful to be able to talk about him in this way, really. No, I appreciate you talking about it. Uh I wanted to ask you too about um about building a relationship with a dead magician or monk. It but can be I built without having the prime materials. Yeah, like you could build Lauren Pocky is dead now, the guy who made your Rahu amulet. Right. And you know, many a giants die young and all that sort of stuff because they all do a bit too much magic. It can kill you in the end if you're not careful. Right. Um but like I I'm now starting to specialize with living magicians because we can go and see them. Right. We can experience their lineage with them. Yeah. So um, this is particularly the case with Ajahn Do it because he he does Sakyan as well as amulets. So, but when you're getting a blessing, he calls his lineage forward to help with the blessing. And sometimes you can see them. He's particularly strong. Um, and once you've seen that or done that or understood it understood it, you can access perhaps one of the greatest sources of power within these things, and that's the power of the ancestor worship, of the lineage of magicians. Of oh, that whole lineage going back. Yeah, wow. Going back for thousands, thousands of years. Um, it's, and it, it's palpable, which is why one reason I've changed a lot of stuff with what, a lot of what we do uh, to try and cope with the coming times. Um, but people are still missing out on the magic that is available through a lineage. They, they're unaware yet that it can be tapped and it can increase the strength of any amulet, you know, by multiple folds. So if I was to build that relationship with Longpur Key. That's just, I mean, how would, like, what, what's the first step? Uh, get a photograph. We can try and find a photograph for you and send it. Um, you, you've already at the first step, in which case, which is, because right. you're wearing the amulet. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. So it just changes the focus of how you work with the amulet, because you're going to have to then go through the amulet. And I'm really carefully choosing my words here because this is your experience to do this. Right. And, you know, I, 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 used, to, well, I used to teach and still teach uh, Tai Chi as a martial art. So it's like martial arts training. We give you a key and you've got to open the door. Right, right. But if this also builds psyche, it builds the strength of the mind, et cetera, et cetera, whereby we can do this and go through these places and access those sources of magic. And it, it's life-changing. 
And I, I really appreciate that too, because the experiential nature of it is what is, counts is what counts. And it's what I like so much. Like one thing I was going to mention before is that that's another part that we are kind of out of balance with um, in this time. And, you know, in a lot of places is that we want to understand, we want everything spelled out. It's this and this and this and this and this and this. And this right and you know diagrammed or something but i mean my my thing is do you want me to spell out stop being a child it's s t o p b e i n g right 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 yeah, yeah. it's the world is not handed to you on a plate darling you right. know what i mean it's, right we have to become our own um examination we have to understand what we are looking for. And if we can't do it, nobody can show it to us. It's just knowledge you throw away, and then you devalue the whole system. Right. It actually is an incredibly destructive process when people are being lazy, mm. you know, rather than being constructive. Right. Uh, to, to themselves as well, it's like a form of self-harm. See, we're back at self-harm again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I certainly have a good deal of experience with that. Well, <laughs> it's male, men do, men do, man. And, and it's, know, different it's just responsibility. And we have, we need this responsibility. People have lost all sense of responsibility, which is why you get so much drama in the world at this time. Yeah. You know, we have to get that back. There's something that you mentioned on Gordon's podcast about what Ajarn Apachai said about, I think it was maybe 2025 20, about everyone loses their anchor. Um, he thinks it's, it's next year. Okay. Yeah. I was uh, going to say, I feel like that's already happened. Yeah, it's next year. He, um, yeah. he misunderstood a question. Okay. And thought, and thought I had said recently, not this is after um, we had the chat with Gordon. And the giant thought had said, what's next year like? And he said, I said, I think everyone goes mad. Nobody can cope. Everyone just loses it. So to which my response was, can we make a amulet to help with that? Yeah, I love <laughs> that. Can. I love that. I love that you're there to ask that question. Um, and we can because they don't think of that, you see. A giant is just within his own magical world. You right. Know? So he doesn't think that, oh, well, actually, yes, we can. You know, so yeah. um, with having an overview of the system that's reasonably decent now, we can formulate these questions and like, can that be done? And it's like, sometimes you'll go, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you yeah. go, might need to think about that a little bit. <laughs> um, because because there's, it's so so complicated what people need. Yeah, and we need to stop people, help people not lose their shit. It's going to be difficult enough, thank you. Right, yeah, absolutely. And, well, that's why, that's what I like so much about the idea of these things sort of calling us into a better version of ourselves, because I think that's what we need to do is rise to the occasion, you know? Yeah, rise to the occasion and be well-armed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, I, got um, my, I got my chef's knife. I might need some more stuff, though. <laughs> it's, uh, well, I actually have two short wooden staffs. Oh, nice. This is kicking out of the conversation with the sword. Right. Uh, two short wooden staffs that are used in the South Thai martial arts. And it's just, you know, battering. Oh, but yeah. the, the sharpened hard wood. So it's there to break bones and everything else. And I think I think that they're my weapon of choice. You know? Yeah, I like it. I mean, some fucker will just shoot me for carrying them, but that doesn't matter. I mean, right. we've all got yeah. to choose our romantic way out. Exactly. Man. As long so as you, you can have your chef's knife and I'll have my two pieces of wood. <laughs> yeah. Which I mean, shit, I'll have to get really close to them. You know what I mean? But I've got okay. I've got experience with it at least. Yeah, I mean, you know, just be friendly. People, right. you know, it generally works. You well, know. you know, that's an interesting thing, too. Um, I've thought a lot about 
the power of Sonia in that way, right? If I have to talk my way out of a really tight spot, not a bad thing to have, right? It's we need meta and we need um, mahani yom, popularity magic, attraction magic. It's very difficult to kill somebody you like. Right. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a good story, which um, I think encompasses the Thai way of doing things. There's a heroine in a, a city called Koral, um, called Yingmo. Yingmo comes in a few hundred years ago, I think it was, and an army had invaded and all the men had buggered off to form a war and come back, just leaving the women in the city. Yeah. So Yingmo arranged, welcomed the invading soldiers and then, you know, took a lot of the all the very attractive girls like herself and um, wanted to go and pleasure the army. Of visitors, you know, and uh, of course, all the uh, upper echelons of the army all got the best choices, and so they went to have entertained them in the in in the, the ways of Thai love, and uh, then when they'd done that and they relaxed, they all cut their throats. Hell yeah! There you go. That's yeah. That's attraction magic for you. <laughs> <laughs> they sliced them to pieces once they'd got them to relax. Right. They let their guard down. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a great both, you know, God forbid we need it literally, but it might be that way. But also as a metaphor, it works too. <laughs> it's, it's the metaphor, really. You know, I mean, I think me or you going to an army and saying, come on, boys, let's get to it. It's not going to work in the same way. Really. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you get shot and you don't get right. close. Enough, you know. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. It's um yeah, you know, it's it's just an example of the war magic here, really, and the understanding of it as well. You know, it's uh, the understanding of life is what's important and what will save our lives, in my opinion. So this is why we have to continue to grow and be better people and be understanding people and not take any shit because right. it can be both, you know? If you live here for any time, you will see everyone thinks, oh, lose your ego, da 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 What a pile of bollocks that is. All monks <laughs> have an ego, yeah? yeah? They have to have an ego, otherwise they won't learn anything. They won't be useful to anybody, yeah? It's more about choices and whether you retract your ego. And because how I'm going to use it, right? How I decide to they, use my ego. They, they know when to use it, when to, when it rises, but without it, they wouldn't even be able to feed themselves. Yeah, I think that's, that's common. Uh, yeah, in a lot of spiritual circles is this idea of losing the ego, which, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've, See it's wrong. That have, yeah. I, because it was, it's wrong. And people waste their time with it. What we're trying to do is to control, is understand ourselves and to control ourselves. Right. And to come from the position that we want to come from, you know? And um, all this, you know, lose your ego, all that sort of stuff. It just means there's somebody in the room who wants to have a bigger ego than you. <laughs> yeah, that's very much so, yeah. And that, that is okay as far as control goes and controlling a group to help them develop, but you do never, ever lose your ego because if you do, you'll be eating the life. Right. Yeah, it's like, um, it's just the, it's, tilting at windmills it is it, 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 yeah. there's a reason that it exists and you know proper use of the will requires the ego i think yeah all our faculties all of yeah, them all of the it. ego is why is how ying Ma, um went to murder her particular soldier right you know and it's going to help wants- protect the people yeah. i care about you know there you go there you go oh, it's, it's the first thing that needs to be removed from it's wrong thinking 
It's, it just serves no purpose and it can waste so many years. And I think it drives people crazy, to be honest. Well, I think people have to go crazy sometimes <laughs> to be able to break it. Yeah. Yeah. To sure. be able to break that you're not. I went to, uh, I've done a lot of drugs. Uh, it was great. And um, <laughs> at some point I realized that I should go and do a silent retreat just for 10, 10 days. And I went in, I didn't speak for 10 days. I meditated, a Vipassana retreat in Suratani, close by. And then I opened my mouth when I finished and I didn't recognize the voice that came up. And I said something and then looked at the, 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 the monk who was taking it and I looked at him and just kind of shrugged my shoulders. And he understood immediately. He says, that's the old you fighting back. Wow. Take it very slowly. That's one of the, the that's your first onion layer, layer of the onion, layer of the shell that needs to come off. Um, it's normal. It happens. But take it very slowly and don't bother speaking for a while. Just watch and wait for things to settle. You know what I mean? Uh, so that was a particularly unusual first break. But we have to make that first break at some point to get out of child, you know, and that can take many, many different forms. Yeah. I had to come to the brink of death, honestly. It helps. Yeah. That's yeah. another one. <laughs> right. That's it'll, another one. it'll do the trick. Yeah. You know, copious amounts of drugs, does it? Yeah. You know? Just something that we, to get us out of baby and to be more useful as people. Very nice. You know, it's funny because we answered a lot of my questions just by talking. Yeah, it just, the gobshite just flows, man. It works like that. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, I do have Can I tell, I, Let me tell you a ghost story. This is why yeah, we're here. Please. Shall I, tell you, I, I was reminded uh, about this one because I just forget these things because it's just part of life. Yeah. Right, well, it's like you, what you were saying before if you focus on it and sit there and woo. Then you're kind yeah, of it's just point, part right? of life. It's, yeah. uh, but this one's quite funny. I'd love to hear um, um, Thailand, in Thailand, the boundary between the real world and the other world is extremely thin. It's actually very like England, to be honest with you, in that respect. And an old mate of mine, Sleazy from Throbbing Gristle and uh, Coyle, came to live here. And we spent many a happy year together before he passed away in 2010. Went through, he, he spent a fortune and had a really good time. Um, and he was thinking about moving up to Chiang Mai, which is actually where I live now. We originally, both of us lived quite close to each other in Bangkok. And he said, come up, and, come up and have a look. And he had this idea that he wanted to live near Chiang Mai in a place called Mae Rim. So he could have the address, Sleazy, Mae Rim, Thailand. <laughs> 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 nice. And we traveled like 700 kilometers for this, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a good endeavor. Um, and we, we, you know, we, I, I got a car and we drove around to all these places and we ended up at one place. And where Sleazy used to live in Western Supermare in England, this is after Jeffy's partner had died. Um, it was the most, it, the most haunted house I've ever been in. You know, the, the, when I stayed there, there was always a kid in the bathroom that I used and an old woman sat in the corner and really palpable as well. You could see them. It's one of those places where they were encouraged and not knocked away. And uh, so we liked haunted houses, you know. Um, he appreciated that boundary. And we went to look at one place and walking in and I was like, fucking hell. You know, you know, light disappeared into the building. It was distorted before we even got in, you know. So it was a case of, well, this is going to be interesting. And um, it was like the shining inside, you know. And the bathroom was, it was terrifying, the bathroom. You know, I, I, I was convinced there was bodies buried in the garden. You know, all that sort of stuff, especially under a couple of yuccas in the corner. And um, Sleazy had felt things, hands going up his leg, 
you know, and the guy who owned the place was showing us around. He could not have been more uncomfortable showing us around. He was the worst advert for renting the place you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. He was just terrified, yeah. And um, Sleazy came out, and he's normal, jolly, selfish. So what do you think? You know, I said, well, if you want to live on your own and die really quickly, it's great, Sleaze. How much is it? He said, it's 50,000. But I said, you're not fucking paying 50,000 a month to die. You know, so um, we kind of left that one alone. And it's that's one of those places that has stuck with me for the rest of, since that point. You know, yeah. that's a, that's as dark as a haunted house can get. And you're easy to spot in Thailand, as they probably are in America, where light distorts. Yeah. You know, it's hard to look at them. And here there's often dogs. Dogs love living with ghosts and they get really aggressive because... Uh, maybe they're being encouraged. I don't know. Mm. But um, yeah, after that point, it was very easy to spot these places. It was actually, it was a haunted house, living in a haunted house that knocked me out of just straight up atheism. And I don't know that I ever really, I mean, I was more resentful against the church than anything else, you know? Yeah. But, well, you got stuff to be resentful against. And sure. the church, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's there. Resent right. it. Right. And so I kind of, you know, I wanted, I always wanted to believe, even when I told myself I didn't, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, this place, I mean, I would hear people calling my name from other rooms. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, my wife at the time, I was like, Hey, did you call me? And she's like, No, I can barely hear you. Like, what like um she got scratched. Wow. Bunch, like, and then we found out later that this guy had um his wife had died in the house, and then like a year later, he had shot himself in the driveway. Wow. Yeah. And um and it, and it had not been dealt with. It hadn't been dealt with, and it's because he and the monks will come in. Right. And see, that's, that's so, yeah, that's really missing here. Um, and so you have that unwellness and it just continues to perpetrate. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Even, I mean, it was even to the point where the people that moved in after us, like tracked us down because some of our mail had gone there, tracked us down on Facebook and we're like, did you guys have anything weird happen there? <laughs> we're like, yeah, well, how about you tell me first and then I'll tell you. Right. Like, um, but that was so undeniable that it knocked me back on my quest, you know, like back on the spiritual quest because yeah. I couldn't. But it has to be understood, doesn't it? Right. Well, and it has to be, I have to be in relation to it. Mm. And I'm going to be one way or the other, right? So I can either yeah. be ignoring it or look into it, but I'm still in relation to it if I'm ignoring it. Yeah. And so the experience was undeniable. And, and I really honestly look back at it. And it was a scary experience, but I look back at it with gratitude because I just think these things have to happen. They have to happen. Yeah. And it happens. I mean, it happened to me since I was a kid, as it probably has a lot of people listening to this. And it happened to my mum, you know, and all that stuff. It's, it, these things have to happen. Otherwise, I think we're missing out. To be honest with you, I'd hate to imagine a life whereby I don't understand these things or right. I don't see them. I've got no feelings whatsoever. God, it'd be awful. Yeah. And that time of my life when I was ignoring them was awful. <laughs> you know, like it's just interesting. Like, talk about coincidences. Well, is it a coincidence that the, like, the worst time of my life was also when I closed myself off to the all yeah. possibility of spirit? And I believed that when I die, it's just going to be nothing. Yeah, well, it can be nothing. It depends what you, you know, it's okay, you know. Yeah, it's, right, that might be okay. Yeah. Hey, it's, it scared the shit know, out of me. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I don't know, I just think we have to, it's a part of nature. We have to come to terms with these things. And, right. And it's in everybody to a certain degree, you know, and we are tens of generations away from people who are anything close to this in effect. You know, and that, that's where we need to go back to. We need the relationship with all that again to be able to take care of the world properly. Right. Yeah. It's a requirement. You know? yeah, just because this is just nature. It's, it's just how it works. Well, it's how it works. 
And if we deny it, we deny ourselves. You know, I've had loads of conversations about spirit, you know, this sort of thing in America. And I think it's one of the causes of all the problems in America, a lot of them. I think I think so too. Especially yeah. the murder rates, you know, all that sort of stuff. I think that nobody and, um, can be that angry all the time, man. Right. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting too, because I was talking to um uh Steve Niner on, on an episode a little bit back. Um and he's great. Uh, but he was talking about that in relation to unaddressed trauma with land spirits too. Yeah. You know, that like a lot of violence sometimes comes down to that. Yeah. Because we haven't acknowledged any of this stuff and we haven't dealt with it. Like you were talking about. And you've there. lost the people who could deal with it. We lost the people that did it or we put them in mental asylums or we, yeah. you know, drugged them up till they couldn't speak anymore. Whatever it is. Yeah. It's been it's- totally removed. It's, you know, there was, in the conversation with Greg from Higher Side Chats, he, it came to his mind, we were discussing land spirits and how important they are, and it came to his mind and said, oh, wow, question for you. He'd had a, a police officer, a detective on his show, who basically um, was investigating instant disappearances. Oh, yeah. Like you turn one way to get a sausage off the barbecue, you turn back and they've gone and they're never seen again. And he said, what would that be in Thailand? I said, land spirits. Or incredibly potent ghosts. But more generally, it would be considered to be a land spirit. And they would work out how to kind of placate it so it doesn't keep doing it. Right, to make things right with the land. And, you know. To make things settled and praised and looked after and considered Right, because there's a lot of there's a uh, and there's a lot of ancient mounds and and things like that here that have just been totally ransacked or like they'll build a prison on top of them or something. Yeah, yeah. And then people wonder why the land seems haunted. And then they wonder why they're angry. Right. They don't know where the influence of that is coming from. Right. You know, there is too much anger in America. It seems that way to the outside world. No, it, it is. And, and that is not natural. There is something deep-seated that is causing that. And at some point, it needs to be addressed. Yeah, It's going to take a few generations before we can get to that point, because there are people working on this already. I know there are. Um, but then they have to train people as well, and that can take two or three generations. There's some very talented magicians over there, and we're going to have to trust that they can work out what to do um, on top of making a living or becoming famous. There has to be what lacks over there, as far as I can see, is a cohesive body of magicians. Right. That needs to happen at some oh, point. It seems like uh, most of the magicians here are at each other's throats. It's, that's too easy. Right. It's the same fucking ghosts, man. Yeah. You know, it's and it used to be the case here in, in many respects. They would test each other as magicians. Um, and magicians still kill magicians here if they get too cheeky. But... In general, they prefer to get together and work together, which is why, despite me saying that this next book is the last one, I'm not going to stop working because I think the next 10 or 15 years are going to be very interesting to to document and and just kind of see what and how they do as a final piece of work to um, what they do to kind of sustain the country. Because, like, here I keep saying to people, you know, they haven't done as much as they should with the climate change and the nature and all that sort of stuff. Nature has only ever provided. And I keep, you know, they're saying, well, the government's busy. It's, well, empower the monks to do it. And they live in nature already. You know, they are the most natural people you'll ever meet. And just put them in charge of planting a tree everywhere that there isn't one. And you will change the face of the country and the generation. You know, it can be done, but it's just nobody's going about it. 
really. And that's the case with a lot of things we're not dealing with as a species. Yeah. I think if we just, and I, you know, like you said, there's a lot, but I honestly think if we just got back to acknowledgement and working with the dead here in any sort of way, because it's just that the state of that is so it's just in ruins. It's totally yeah, in shambles. I think that would help. Yeah. Uh, ancestor worship is also related to the land because people right. die on the land. Yeah, and they yeah. become spirits. And that's one land. of the forms of spirit house here. There's two forms, basically, two or three forms. One, we uh, here, we don't know if people died on this land, so we have a different type of spirit house. Um, in other places, if you know people have died on the land, you have a grandmother and grandfather figure which is to represent all the females who died here and all the males who died here and praise them and take care of them as a, as a body on, on your particular ownership of the land and to keep them happy, keep them confined, stop interfering with the living, you know. It's, but it's a, it's a rare skill. There's not many places in the world can do it. Well, and here too, like, I think one of the one thing that can go a huge distance towards this uh, for anyone listening that's in america is learn about the people that used to take care of the land that you're now enjoying because yeah. there's that's one of those things too that the ancestral custodians of the land were removed and then people yeah. just don't know but like all i mean you can thank them in the morning <laughs> you know and that's it, huge that, and that goes a long way thank them while pouring water onto the ground yeah, as an act of um, purity and being beneficent to the ground, to the earth itself, and just introduce very, very simple practices. You know, five incense into the ground and just say thank you for being here. And, you know, and it has an effect. It's not, it's a beginning. Right. There is much more involved in that. And it leads to, and, yeah, and I can speak from experience to anyone that is interested. Something as simple as putting out water and incense for something or someone can lead to the most amazingly unexpected wild times, man. <laughs> like really cool shit. We you don't know? say thank you enough. Right. And that in general, just that has changed my life yeah. in a huge way. And, you know, we have a spirit house outside the front um, that was consecrated by Jan Sir. So he draws a, a yan on metal. It's a spell on metal. And that is under the spirit house to help control it. And I didn't know they did that. So this is not just plonking houses in places. Right. It's, it takes skilled magicians to do this. But we can start the process. The process cannot start in that way. It's too complicated but you can start the process of finding out how to create and embody your area of land. What right. what did they say? What did the Indians do to do that? But they had no sense of ownership. That's well, the problem. right. Well, that and then you know they they asked. <laughs> I think is part of it too. You know, yeah. like if I want to know what a lover wants, I ask. You know, yeah. like it's just that simple and you know there are lines of communication that it, like we we're talking about the meditation those practices that help those lines of communication to be open yeah for those answers and to wait come. wait for the answer yes yeah, it's never as quick as what you think it's going to be when i enter some graveyards that are particularly uh, strong or wild if before I take a photograph, I ask with my mind if I've got position, uh, permission to do this. And you have to keep your mind clear until the permission comes. And sometimes they take it's like, come on, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've got a photograph yeah. to take. It's changing. <laughs> and then I have to wait again. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when all else fails, you can't go wrong plying someone with tobacco and booze. There you go. Yeah, it's it helps, but we have to 
get that connection and forming yeah. that connection can take time because of the mental chatter. Oh, yeah. Uh, my favorite story with that was trying to connect to Med Bear. Med Bear is like always de she's often depicted as having her legs open. She's, you know, the eternal mother, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I had the most astonishing Med Bear amulet. And um, in the end, when she managed to get through, she was screaming so loud. It was like a you know, 100 watt uh, PA system. So, no, because I just blocked. I couldn't accept that particular channel. But then once you find that channel, you can go back to it at will. Same with, it's a different channel for most of them as well. Same with um, uh, like the uh, amulets for foresight, different channel, different way of doing it. And we have to kind of play with ourselves until we can find it. And right. then find it again. First time's the most difficult. After that, gets easy. Oh, thank you for telling that story. That's really, that's good. Yeah. Because, you know, it just takes patience and looking. And understand it can take time. Right. And, well, there's it's such okay. a there's such a block, especially on the modern mind, uh, against... Oh, well, you know, I was just making that up. And the thing is, like, yeah, maybe, but I can't really be thinking like that if I want, like, I have to be open, too, right? Yeah. And, like, there's a level of discernment, of course. Yeah. Right? But I don't know. Like, if, if I'm able to think it, to some extent, it's real. We have to approach that with a certain degree of care uh, and to wait to really decide on whether it's real or not. Um, you're waiting for something palpable. And again, there's no rush with that, you know, um, because we, the mind can be uh, very naughty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and, you know... Yeah, and and lead us astray, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Funny, funny enough. <laughs> it's so, yeah, talking about the mind this, leading you astray. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All this is just first of all, be nice to yourself. Take care of yourself. Understand that you're not mad. If you are mad, at least you're happy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but just. Take it slow and do it with equanimity. Don't let these things take over. Yeah. You know, we have to retain that, be at the center of this. And um, once we are, it can work, it can really start to work in a better way. There's no rush is always a good thing for me to hear. <laughs> yeah, there's no rush. It is it's okay. You know, we've yeah. got years yet, you know. And if not, we can come back and do it again next time. Right. Yeah. You know, it's it's okay. It doesn't matter. You know, it's uh, because I think retirement's finished. Unless we unless we become infirm, so you know we right. need to keep fit until we drop dead, um, or somebody drops us. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, so all that's finished. So we've got loads of time, man. We just got to stay healthy and have a happy life and um, get on with it. And understand that things are coming, and they're going, and things will change. And just to accept it, we have to learn to bend a little, right? Or we'll get out of the cities. Get out of the cities, you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. going to get. Rough. It's not going to be pretty in the cities. So you know, people have said to me, "What can we do to prepare for anything?" And it's just well. We're all adults. We know what's, and it might be a bit difficult. So just kind of run it through your mind and get a picture of what you actually are able to do. Right. You know, and because you can't suddenly turn around tomorrow and go, like, go and buy a farm and start farming, you can, you'll just be an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> right. Uh, but you can consider other aspects and come to your own formulation as a responsible human being with intelligence about what you can do 
And in, in that way, you're taking care of yourself. Uh, and, having, you know, yeah. make friends. You know? Yeah. And hopefully useful friends. Or be Helpful. useful yourself where people want to be near you. Yeah. It's, um, there's well, no point worrying about this. There's no point um, stressing yourself to pieces. You know, it's going to happen anyway. So we have to, we have a lot to learn basically before it does. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think we'll necessity will dictate that we learn quite a bit, I think. Um, or, or or collapse in a in a ball, crying our eyes out. One of the right. two, yeah. And that's okay if that's how you start. That's all right. Yeah, I you, think I went you know, through a period of despair. Um, but I I don't know. I I I think I it was like a morning almost. You know what I mean? Because I knew that the world enough. the world that I knew was not going to be anymore. I just knew it. Yeah, that's fair enough. It's okay. Yeah. It's like, uh, I'll, I'll liken it to the Queen of England. I, you know, I actually cried for my mum. Yeah. Because it was like, you know, it was, she'd been the queen the whole of my life, and that was a, the most recent disturb, yeah, emotional event, and I cried for that reason. Yeah. So it's okay. And then you pick yourself up and you get on with it again. Yeah. Well, there's nothing you can do. You get on with it. You've got, you got a life to live. And um, it's going to be good. And I believe that, you know, there is glitter in there. Right. So, um, you know, it's disaster, but with glitter on top. And that sounds all right. Yeah, that's okay. Right? <laughs> it tickles me anyway. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. It's a great image. It's, uh, you know, I think, um, yeah, I think that's how it's my future is going to be for a while. Excellent. Well, um, we've talked for a good two hours. I don't want to keep you all morning. Um, how are you feeling? I think I might go and make some bread, actually. Nice. And uh, we're going to have a weekend at home. Very good. Yeah, yeah. This was, you know, we've worked, I've been working far too hard recently and uh, still got a, a quite amazing interview to uh, translate. And Nice. Uh, spend time just kind of enjoying where we are on the on the day in Chiang Mai. Awesome. Yeah, it'd be lovely. That sounds great, especially yeah. the bread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to tell the uh, tell the listeners um, promote? You know where they can find you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm I'm easy to find. It's thetirecult.com. All one word, all lowercase. Um, I'm on Facebook as the Tire Cult Books because I think we're up to six now. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for me, self awareness is how self growing is how we're going to get through this. I think we need to focus on improving our physical and mental state uh, because it's a combination of the two that we need and uh, in my opinion we need to start by finding out whether our birth chart needs balancing having the elements balanced within us we can now find out which is, this is all stuff that's in the next book that will hopefully come out next year we can now find out whether you're suited to using certain sort of amulets we can find out what are the best amulets to balance your birth chart, things that are missing, like some people have not got enough attraction, some people need protection. And basically, it's like the bare, the bare minimum that you need to improve your life because, you know, we might not be in a position for any more than that. Yeah? Um, and this is all coming from all the experience gained through writing about uh, a remarkable ancient system of magic and we are continuing to study to see what benefit it can bring to the people at large without having to spend too much because we don't know the state of money and right. the economy and everything else that's coming so um 
this has all been carefully considered for the past two to three years. And we're now getting towards that point where uh, I'm quite happy with what we can produce to help people in every way we think they will need it. It's going to be interesting. It sure will. But I'm glad I you're... I hope to fuck that we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too, but I'm going to prepare as if we're dead on and you're dead on. Well, right? this it doesn't do any harm. Yeah. It doesn't do any harm to do that. It just it opens the mind, helps you see how your life is, what you know, what is important, you know, how we can live, love, laugh, and enjoy ourselves for the rest of our lives, and uh, and just enjoy it. Yeah, prioritize, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. It's this number one thing. Well, I really appreciate what you do because I, you know. It's it really makes me think too because the timing that this has come into my life it's one of those coincidences. <laughs> there you go. You know, yeah. because things appear when they're meant to appear. It's magic is rising all around the world. There's millions of different types. You can go and study any you want. It's all very similar. Yeah. Right. Uh, just remember that you've got to be a better person through that. If it's not beneficial in that way, do something else. Yeah, and uh, in that way, we can be useful to our friends and ourselves. And uh, the future awaits with glitter. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jenks. I really had a great time talking to you. And man, to you too, Tim. Actually, that was lovely. Thank you very much. I love your van, man. Love your van. Hey, thank you. I. I'll have to send you some pictures of the outside. It's great. Yes, please. Yeah, I'd love that. It's not just a box in your back garden, is it? (laughs) (laughs) Do you experience weird shit? Do your parents not like to tell their friends about what you do in the woods? Do you make more friends in a graveyard than you do at a party populated by living humans? Do you have interactions with beings that are not strictly considered human? Do other people look at you like you're crazy when you mention talking to trees in casual conversation? If you fist pumped or even just answered yes to any of these questions, you may be a nightbird. So let's sing together. If you'd like to come on the show and flap your gums with me, share your stories, or just talk about the malleable nature of reality for a while, then send me an email at tim at nightbirdpodcast.com. That's tim at nightbirdpodcast.com. I'd love to have you on the show. But until then, I gotta fly. But before I go, let me say this. Remember, you are never alone. I believe you. <laughs>